Hey all. So today I wanted to touch on something uh, that is going to be fun to finally make use of, and that's Rover's primary motors. So the the things that are actually going to turn the wheels. Oh, you know what? Let me get you uh, the wheel. Is that wicked or what? Look at the size of these things. The size of my head, which was kind of the point. Um, I think they're awesome. Um, eventually. Um, I'll put some detail on them to really kind of spice them up, but uh, there's a whole story about these and, and I'll talk about them. Um, I don't know, maybe in another episode, but these are kind of customized for Rover's needs um, from RC tires, but RC tires, these come uh, basically kind of squishy, um, empty, or, or not empty, but they come with foam inserts that are um, much too soft for rover's needs. So if you were to press on them, they'd actually collapse. Um, and for, for rover's purposes, we want these firm, so I had to customize them. So maybe I'll cover that in another episode. But basically, these are the primary motors, these are the wheels, these, this is how they're going to connect. Um, and that's kind of <laughs> the stuff that I've been most excited about. Um, coming, you know, do, doing this uh, YouTube channel and especially this season, season, um, you know, called Reviving Rover, actually getting these things to turn. Um, so we're almost there now. Uh, so actually an update on yesterday's post, which was in regards to the wireless communication. So I've made progress on that front as well in implementing uh, a feedback loop. So basically when, if you watch that episode, if not, watch it, or this way, or up there um, on YouTube, but basically so that when a command gets sent from Rover's Android tablet brain over to the Arduinos, we want the Arduinos to report back that yes, we've received that command, we're ready for the next command. Um, and not for that basically to loop endlessly and keep repeating that same command over and over again, obviously. So that's in place now and we're closer than ever really to getting these mounted. Um, before we can mount these, we have to mount these. Um, and before I actually mount these, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of how these were chosen. So if you've ever done a project like this or even thought about doing a project like this, one of the very first things you're going to tackle is the decision around motors. Um, and a lot of your other decisions are going to be based off of what you choose um, on this particular front. So there's an enormous amount of choice out there. Uh, big ones, small ones, um, brushless DC motors, uh, brushed DC motors, which is what these are. And then within each camp, you're going to have different voltages and, and uh, stall currents and all that stuff. And it gets really a bit overwhelming, especially if you were like me when you were originally picking them. When I was originally picking them, it's, it's really overwhelming to try to understand all the new concepts, the jargon, uh, and how to ultimately make the right choice. Um, once you make that choice, that then impacts what you're going to choose for motor controllers and that then dictates how much power you need, so your batteries, you remember these are Rover's batteries. Um, we'll, we'll talk about those in a separate episode because that's a whole story as well. But um, yeah, so in regards to motors, so they're kind of... The two biggest camps, the way I can define them, are the brushed and brushless uh, DC motors. And the brushless are the ones that you're going to find in kind of RC cars and that sort of thing. They're like high RPM, high revolutions per minute, um, high power draw. They don't need to last very long, you know, if you get to play with it for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, you know, the, the drones that are popular for right now with DJI and and now um, a GoPro with its Mavic, uh, or Karma, I should say. 
uh, those use brushless motors. They spin really high um, rates and they draw power really quickly so they'll drain the batteries within about 15, 20, max 25 minutes. Um, but for the purposes that's what you need. You need those blades to rotate quickly um, and you sacrifice longevity of the battery. In Rover's case I didn't want crazy speed. I, I don't, I'm not looking for Rover to, to jump over mountains. I want him to be able to move around and ideally to be able to, to last the day or even longer. Um, you might have heard me mention that he's going to be solar powered so that's that was another reason why I chose those particular batteries which we'll talk about in another episode. But it all kind of interconnected because how you choose your motors then dictates everything else, like I said. So, um, voltages. So these happen to be 24 volt motors, which was my original plan for Rover, um, to run him at 24 volts. I've since changed my mind and I'm going to run him at 12 volts. Now, the great thing about motors like these is you're not going to damage them if you run them at lower voltage. So these are 24 volt motors, but if you run them at 12 volts, basically they just run at half the speed. Um, you could get into problems if you were to run them at max, um, you know, max 12 volts for a long time. Um, you might get heat problems, but that's never going to be the case for Rover anyway. It's not like he's going to be sprinting down the street. He's really going to be sh kind of moving in short bursts where these turn for you know, a few seconds at a time, maybe a minute at most, and, and then they stop. So there's never really going to be heat buildup, which again, these are all things that you need to think about. Um, but that was what ultimately pushed me towards brushed DC motors and kind of high higher voltage DC motors, uh, brushed DC motors, so that I could get the amperage down. So the amperage is basically how quickly you suck juice, suck power out of your batteries. And like I said, I wanted it to be a trickle. I, I don't need high power. I just want something that's going to um, be able to get Rover moving around and keep his batteries lasting for as long as possible. Uh, so these have a, at 24 volts, they have a stall current of only two amps. At 12 volts, which is what I'm going to be using, they have a stall current of four amps. Um, which is also the stall, the uh, max output of the batteries. See how it works together? Uh, so basically at maximum pull, uh, the batteries will still be able to kind of give the motors what they need. Um, although you don't really want to be at stall for any longer than a few moments. And in Rover's case, he probably won't ever be in that situation. But I'll also include some, some scripting, some code, uh, some logic to, to prevent him from getting to that point. And if he does get to that point, to get him out of it and kind of cut the, cut the power. Um, if you have questions about that, just hit me up for that stuff specifically. But uh, you can see how it all kind of interconnects. Uh, the, the motors are big. Um, and they're not cheap. These particular motors run, I think, somewhere around... I'm going to include a link down below for an example of, of where you can buy motors like this. And new, I didn't buy these new. New, they cost, I think, about 300 US a piece, um, which is a bit crazy. Um, motors, good motors aren't cheap, no matter what. But uh, I think I picked up six of these for about $100 on eBay. Um, I've actually been looking for additional motors just in case uh, on eBay and I haven't come across another set like this in a long time. Um, so kind of when you see a good deal, go for it. Uh, but eBay is a great place to pick up some high quality, cheap motors. Um, I mean, being, being able to find in motors with encoders, that's another thing we need to talk about. Um, for that sort of price range, you know, 25, 20 bucks a piece, it's like unheard of. Uh, so that's what actually got me to go for these. So this is how they actually come. Um, so DC motors, so a traditional DC motor you would get kind of with 
this part forward. You wouldn't have this thing. This thing is what's called the encoder. And most of these wires coming out of this motor are actually related to the encoder, not to driving the, the motor. So let me show you what an encoder looks like. I happen to have the, uh, the sixth motor that for some reason the guy who sold them to me sent, sent it without this last bracket um, that actually covers it. In, in any case, I never planned on actually using six motors on Rover. Um, but anyway, it's a long story. I ended up with six. Um, but this happens to be opened up, so I don't know if you can make it out. So what you see here is a tiny little, little wheel. Let me, and this turns. Um, this turns a lot faster than this primary shaft. So this is where you connect your, your wheel to or whatever you're actually trying to drive. This turns at a much higher rate. And if you can make it out, it's got tiny little slots in it. This here is uh, what's referred to as a quadrature optical encoder. And basically what that means is it's the quad means four times, but optical, I mean, you know what optical means. It's basically counting the number of um, slots, slots that are passing between the uh, the optical readouts in this encoder. And that's basically how it can tell how fast that disk is rotating. And that then, that information then travels up this cable into Rover's motor controllers, the RoboClaws. We've talked a lot about the RoboClaws. Um, and then the RoboClaws then interpret that, um, the number of ticks basically, um, the number of slats, slots, is the number of ticks, uh, to then indicate to Rover, to the RoboClaws, to the Arduinos, to the Android tablet brain, how quickly this thing is actually rotating. And then based on that, you can say, for example, this many ticks equals this many centimeters or meters or what have you, um, which I haven't actually ever measured yet, so that's going to be one of the things that we get to do once he's rolling forward. Um, but this was pretty critical. So getting a, a good size motor, um, low current draw with an encoder is pretty rare um, if you don't want to pay the whopping prices that typically come with them, um, which I did, especially when I was first starting out and I didn't know how far I was actually going to get in this project, you know, this is going back a couple of years. But that piece is pretty critical. So if you think about driving uh, a robot, but I mean, think about it in the sense of driving anything. In Rover's case, we've got four independent motors, four wheels, four motors, um, all turning. We need them in sync. If you, for example, set, um, didn't know exactly how quickly uh, each motor was turning and you just asked the four motors to turn for, you know, two seconds, if one motor happens to be a little bit faster, a little bit more um, well lubricated than the other motors, um, Rover's not going to drive in a straight line. And then you're going to appreciate that that then has implications for everything else. If we're happen happening to try to navigate something or, or measure the distance to something or, or what have you with his uh, range sensors. So being able to have relatively precise control over how um, Rover is moving was very important. Hence, the encoders really critical. Um, and then of course having encoders also dictates what kind of motor controllers you choose. Um, in our case it was the RoboClaws, uh, the 2 by 5 amps, again the amperage representing kind of what power draw we were going to be needing to drive those motors. Um, so it, it all really does interconnect. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about were this, this kind of white thing. Um, so I'm going to include a link down below, um, but basically I designed these myself and had them 3D printed. Um, that was a whole other project. Um, unfortunately, I did that two years ago, and I don't have um, you know my notes or anything like that from back then. But I will say that it was it was quite a process to do it, um, but it worked out amazingly well. Um, there's a lot to be considered kind of when designing something like this. You want it to be strong. Um, in my case, I actually needed it to be quite flexible as well. 
um, because I didn't want to completely dismantle these things in order to get that sleeve on. So the sleeve actually has to be able to kind of slip on this way. Um, so they're flexible enough that I can get them on, get them off if I need to, without having to take the whole motor apart in order to slide it on this way. Um, but the plastic is also hard enough that it actually creates a very secure uh, grip on the motor. Um, thanks to these little clips that I created in the design and this mounting bracket that basically accepts the, uh, I forget the link, but I'll include the link down below to what these brackets are, where you can get them. And this then fits with all the other components that make up Rover. Um, but uh, this 3D printing, the, the file for it and everything, uh, I've actually posted this on uh, Shapeways. That's where I purchased them from myself. And anybody who is interested in getting these sorts of motors with this or resizing the design to fit your own motors, you're more than welcome to it. Um, there's, no, there's no cost, there's no charge by me. It's just whatever Shapeways will charge you for, for the actual printing. Um, but the file is on there and I'll include the link down below on Rover's website. Um, so once we get past that, then we have this part. This part is basically the adapter that connects the motor um, to this amazing tire. Uh, so inside the tire, so like I said, this is a from an RC uh, type vehicle. You'll see that it's a kind of a hex type bolt in there. Um, and Basically, you just find the correct uh, pattern and size and all that to accept the shaft um, to fit. And then it's just a matter of kind of screwing on with one nut. It's got the matching hex pattern underneath this. Let me take that off and I can show you better. So you can see that there's the matching hex pattern there. It's actually slotted, so it doesn't exactly look like a hex pattern, but it fits. Um, and then once it's on the motor, you basically just screw it on and you're all set. Um, so on the other end, we've got a, a ground and a power and a separate ground and power for the, uh, for the encoder. So it has power. And then you've got an in and out for reading the, the encoder's values. Um, but that's basically Rover's motors. And that's how I came about to uh, you know, in choosing them and, you know, all the consequences of how I went about that and what that meant. Um, and yeah, so really exciting. Uh, so the, the process of finishing up and tweaking, there's still some bugs in the code, uh, but they're not big enough bugs to hold everything else up. So I kind of want to move on with the process of getting him um, kind of sitting or standing on his own feet. And, uh, yeah, really exciting. So next steps, getting these puppies on. And if you're interested in, in seeing that process, uh, stay tuned and I'll chat with you guys next time. Cheers.